Hello, all astronomers. Uh, we're up to chapter three now, so thank you for your work so far, and I'll be commenting on the discussion board, and I will be putting up some grades here shortly for assignments that have already been turned in. Uh, I thank you for your work, and we're going on to chapter three now. I will try to share the screen here and uh, see what I can do. Actually, let's see. Zoom isn't always playing nicely with us, but let's give it a share here. Okay, so we are into chapter three, and maybe we can view the slideshow. Yes, we're going to talk about orbits and gravity today. Of course, gravity is something that holds us all in place here on Earth. Gravity is what holds the moon onto the Earth. Gravity is what holds the Earth onto the sun. Gravity holds lots of things together. Now, gravity is a very weak force. We might think if it's holding everything together, how can it be such a weak force? But think about it this way. Every time you pick something up, you're defying gravity. But gravity permeates the cosmos. Gravity reaches out to everything in the solar system and everything beyond. Everything exerts a gravitational force on everything else if it has mass, if it has matter. As we watch things around our planet, like the International Space Station that we're seeing here, we might think it's in zero gravity because it's in outer space. But the truth is, it's only a couple of hundred miles above us. And if the moon, which is 250,000 miles away, is held in orbit by the Earth's gravity, surely there's gravity here on the International Space Station. But the International Space Station is moving very fast. As you see, it goes around the Earth once every 90 minutes or so. It's going 17 to 18,000 miles an hour. It has a sunrise and a sunset every 90 minutes, 16 times a day. Uh, so, so it doesn't seem to have gravity inside because we're actually fooling the environment inside. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, we left off last time, we were talking about Galileo and Copernicus and various others who were figuring out where things were in the cosmos. Uh, they were beginning to understand that we go around the sun, not the sun going around us, and that other planets go around the sun. And what they began to think about what it was that was important in terms of how things worked. We were beginning to understand what patterns we were seeing, but we weren't always able to understand exactly why it was working that way. Uh, there was an idea from Aristotle uh, that the heavier things seek the bottom and the lighter things seek the top, and the idea from Aristotle was also that the earth was in the center. So there was the idea that all the things up in the sky were in fact very light and fluffy, as it were. They were all heavenly stuff that was of a different ilk from what we have here on uh, the planet. And of course, the churches, the Catholic Church in particular, uh, took the ideas of Aristotle to heart, but the Protestant churches also looked at the ancient ideas and kept them in place. Copernicus's idea that the sun was in the center of the solar system uh, was first published in a book in uh, uh, 1543, uh, the year he died. And his book became a sort of a sticking point between many people for several generations, because there were those who wanted to believe that the earth was in the center for philosophical and religious ideas. But in terms of figuring out how things work in the sky, putting the sun in the middle had some particular advantages. We talked about this the last time a little bit, this uh, idea of retrograde motion. As we are going around the sun, we are going a little bit faster than an, a planet, say, like Mars. So our view of what it looks like in the sky, as you see up here in the top, will differ depending upon where we are in our orbit. And as we lap the planet, it looks like from our perspective that it goes backwards and then it goes forwards again when it catches up with us as we round the curve. Now. Ptolemy's idea, remember Ptolemy? He was the guy who wrote the Almagest or the Great Book or the Big Book, had this idea that the planets out here were going around in loop-de-loops, epicycles, as they went around us. 
and the sun was also going around us, but the problem is it didn't do loop-de-loops. So there was never a real explanation as to why the sun and the moon didn't do these loops, but the other planets did along the way. One of the ways in which we could tell if we had good enough eyesight that things were going around the sun rather than us would be this. Look at this here, the geocentric model. That means everything's going around the Earth and sometimes they're doing these loops as they're going around. If we were to look at Venus, notice the phases here. We can see a little bit of a crescent, a little bit of a crescent. We can see a little bit of a crescent. That's basically all we ever see of Venus because we're not going to see anything here or here that it's in the, in the, it's in the way of the sun. But if Venus is going around the sun, rather than going around the Earth and doing its loop-de-loops down here. We call this the heliocentric model. Helio means sun. Notice there's a crescent, and there's a quarter, and there's a gibbous, and there's a full. We get all of the same phases that we get on the moon, because the moon, as it goes around us, gets its phases from the sun. This, as it's going around us, doesn't get phases because it's doing these loop-de-loops and the sun is not reflecting on it in the proper way. So we would have to see all of these phases. Well, in 1543, there was no way to see these phases. But when Galileo came along with his telescope in 1608, 1609, we could finally see these phases. And it confirmed that Venus was going around the sun. Now, in between those two people, Remember, we had uh, our, our guy Copernicus, and Copernicus died in 1543. And then in 1608-1609, Galileo used a telescope for the first time to look up in the sky. Between these two dates. We have this guy here, and his name is Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe, if you speak the, the, the sort of the Danish or the uh, even getting into the, the, the Latinate way he talked about things. This guy is one of my favorite history of astronomy guys around. He was a nobleman. That's what this sort of chain of office means. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that he has a fake nose. You don't quite see it here in, in this. You might see just a little bit of a ridge. His nose got chopped off in a duel. He was having a dispute with a fellow student when he was in college, and back in those days, you wore a sword to, to class. They got into a fight, and his nose got chopped off. And he had a fake nose. He had at least two fake noses that we know of. One was probably bronze, and one was probably gold. But he became a uh, noted astronomer. He was probably the best astronomer ever in terms of looking at the sky and telling where things are. Now, he passed away in 1601. Notice the date here. Galileo didn't get the telescope up until 1609. Uh, but he built, Tycho built his own instruments to make very careful understandings. And this is one of those here. This, this is actually a mural on a wall in his house. Uh, he was, lived on an island called Venn in Sweden. Uh, it, it's, it's now in Sweden. Uh, it was a part of Denmark back then. But notice there's a window up at the top here. Now, if you're sitting down here where this guy is writing on the table, you can look up sort of straight up through that and see what's in the sky there. If you're over here where this guy who's standing on the side is, is probably listening to the guy calling down, you can see in that direction. If you're up here, you can see in this direction. You can actually see pretty much the whole sky, at least the whole southern sky, through that little aperture. And because you have this huge mural on the wall, this is actually life-size. These guys are life-size here. You can actually move your instrument guides along so you can get increasingly precise measurements. And he measured for 30 years where the moon was, where the sun was, where nearly a thousand stars were, but in particular where the planets were. 
one of the things he wanted to do was chart out how everything moved. Because by the time he was doing his work, notice his years here, 1546, just after Copernicus died, 1601, right before Galileo used the telescope, he had noticed that that book, that big book that Ptolemy was using, was out of date. It was 1,500 years old by this point, and it was increasingly out of date. It would tell you where Mars was supposed to be, and it would be a couple of months off. So he made these hugely precise star charts and planetary charts. And he hired, near the end of his life, this guy over here named Kepler. Now, Kepler might have been one of the best astronomers ever in terms of math. Tycho over here was the best astronomer ever, and I'll still say, in my opinion, he was the best astronomer ever in terms of observation, looking at the sky and saying where things are. Kepler was one of the best at taking that information and saying how it works. It's often depicted it with holding mathematical instruments in his hand, like a compass or a protractor or something like that here. He really had actually bad eyesight. He could barely see anything in the sky. But he took the information that Tycho gave him, especially on the planet Mars and some of the other planets too, and he figured out that things do not go around in perfect circles. They go around in ellipses. That was actually a big, big thing because Aristotle said everything in the sky goes around in perfect circles. And that was supposed to be part of the perfection of the heavens, the perfection of the sky. Well, as Kepler kept trying to take the data that Tycho put together and put it into equations, you have equations for ellipses, you have equations for circles, they never fit a circle. They fit an ellipse. Now, the equations, I'm not going to make you do them, so don't panic, but equations for circles and ellipses and other things we call parabolas, often we have comets that will come from far away and go back out. They'll follow a parabola or a hyperbola, a parabolic or hyperbolic orbit. A hyperbolic sort of comes here and goes over there, sort of shallow. Parabola goes up and comes back down in sort of the same direction. An ellipse and a circle are both closed, but notice they're all part of a cone. We call those conic sections. So their equations are very similar to each other. The way you draw an ellipse would be to take two thumbtacks, a string, and a pencil, and go around. So the points are always going to be the same length of string from those two points. Now here's the interesting thing. Take those two points and put them together in the middle here. Now you can have two thumbtacks, one string going around. That's a circle. A circle is simply an ellipse where there is zero distance between these two. That's why they're related. And Kepler said, basically, you can you can't put the planets into a circular orbit. You can put them into an elliptical orbit. And that also helped explain why sometimes when we look at planets, they seem to be going faster in the sky, and sometimes they seem to be going slower in the sky. The sun is at one of those two points. And as they're cl closer to the sun, they go faster. And as they go further from the sun, they go more slowly. And these areas here, say T, T for time, so let's say this is a month, that month there and that month there. See, it's going faster here, it's going slower here. But this whole area A and this whole area B are equal to each other. If I had a carpet and this was, say, 25 square yards here, this would be 25 square yards here, just cut a little differently. That's the second law, equal areas in equal times, because they're both one month. So the first law is everything goes around in an ellipse. The second law is as they go around an ellipse, they go around in equal areas in equal times. And then his third law was that the further out you are from the sun, the slower you go. P is the time that it takes to go around the sun, the period of your orbit around the sun. R is the average distance. 
So as you go further and further out, p squared, so the, the time times time, equals roughly the r, the average distance in astronomical units to the sun. Remember an astronomical unit? One astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the earth, 93 million miles. So as we look at these, notice it goes from 88 days to 225 days to 365 days to 687 days, goes further and further and further out. As we look at the other planets, they will go even further and further out in terms of how far and how long it takes for them to go around. Now this was all very well and good. This was talking about where things are in the sky and how to predict how things are going around. But it took Isaac Newton to come along to figure out the why, figuring out how things work, not just in terms of where they are in the sky, but why they stay there. Why do things go faster? Why do things go slower? Why don't things just fly off the handle? So Newton figured out, really in some ways plagiarizing a bit from Galileo, that we have different ways of understanding motion. And this is physics here. The first law says that you have inertia. You have either something staying where it is or something continuing going the way it's going unless something outside acts on it. That's what this net force stuff is all about. The first law is very simply put. An object that is at rest will stay at rest an object that is moving will continue moving in the same way unless something outside acts on it. So if I sit something down, it's going to stay there unless something acts on it. It can be sunlight, it can be gravity, it can be earthquakes, it can be any number of things, but something has to act on it, otherwise it's sitting right there. Also, if I throw something in the sky, it will just keep going unless an outside force acts on it. Now, this is one of the things that was throwing people off because people thought everything goes in a curve. If I throw a curve, if I throw a ball, it's going to curve across and eventually fall down. If I'm at a pitcher's mound over here and I throw a pitch, it's not just going to go straight. It's actually going to curve through the sky and it's going to either be going up and then back down, or it's going to go straight across and then down. Well, that's because the gravity of the Earth down below is pulling on it. Take away that gravity, and it just keeps going at the same speed and in the same direction. That was what people didn't realize. The Earth is pulling on everything. And the way we can measure that is with a net force, and our forces equal, and this is Newton's second law, mass times acceleration. So if you have a lot of mass, you don't have to have a lot of acceleration to have a lot of force because they multiply. So mass times acceleration. So a lot of mass here in the space shuttle doesn't have to go very fast for it to have a lot of force. But also, if you have a lot of force, you don't have to have a lot of mass. Take, for example, an arrow or a bullet. They don't have a lot of mass, but you put a lot of acceleration behind it and it's a lot of force. Here, we have quite a lot of force from both mass and acceleration. This orange thing here and these white things on either side of the orange tank are all just fuel tanks. And they burn through 730 pounds of fuel to lift one pound off the Earth. Because even though gravity is rather weak, notice it got off the pad there fairly easily, it will in fact take a lot of force to break free entirely of the Earth's gravity. And whenever we're doing a launch, whenever we're doing anything really, we have the third law. There's an equal and opposite force happening at the same time. If I'm standing on the, on the floor, the floor is pushing up on me at the same force that I'm pushing down. Gravity is pulling me down at 225 pounds. Unfortunately, I weigh too much. The floor is pushing back up on me with 225 pounds of force. If it was pushing up with more, then I would be catapulted out of my chair. If it was pushing up with less, I would be falling through the floor. So this is 
the synopsis of Newton's laws. There are three laws of Kepler and three laws of Newton. The three laws of Kepler are everything goes around in an ellipse. The ellipses go around in equal times and equal uh, uh, areas. And the further out the planets are, the longer it takes. According to that equation, p squared equals r3. Newton's three laws, anything that's at rest or motion stays in rested motion unless something outside acts on it. The second law is that little equation, force equals mass times acceleration. And then the third law says for every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction along the way. Now out in space, everything is attracted to everything else. Down here on Earth, everything is attracted to everything else. It may not always seem that way. We're talking physics-wise here. We're not talking psychologically. We're not talking about last call at the bar. Gravity is an attractive force. But everything in the universe is attracted ultimately to everything else gravitationally. But it depends upon how close things are. If you take things twice as far away, they're only going to be one-fourth as attractive. If you take things three times as far away, they're only going to be one-ninth as attractive. And that's because of this clunky equation up here. The force of gravity, that's what Fg means, equals Let's not worry about the G, that's just called the gravitational constant, that's just a number we throw in there to make things balance. Mass times mass, the two masses here, divided by the distance squared. So when we have the distance squared is two, then it's going to be one-fourth as attractive. When the distance squared is three times as far away, it's one-ninth as attractive. When it's four times as far away, it's one-sixteenth as attractive. So you see gravity falls off rather quickly. Now gravity here on Earth pulls us down roughly 10 meters per second or 10 yards per second squared. That means it's 10 meters per second every second. Uh, it says 9.8 here, but we're going to go with 10 because it's easier mathematically and close is good in astronomy. So 10 meters per second squared, what does that mean? That means if I jump off the roof and I'm falling, after one second I had a radar gun, it would say I'm going 10 meters per second. After another second I'm down here, and if the radar gun was on me again, it would say I'm going 20 meters per second now. That's how fast. I picked up speed as I'm falling. So I picked up another 10 meters per second. So after three seconds, I'm going 30 meters per second. At four seconds, I'm going 40 meters per second. That's why you get faster and faster and faster as you fall. If you're going out of a plane, if you're doing parachute jumping, for example, you get faster and faster and faster. Now there's a, a limit because the air is pushing up on you. But if there was no air pushing up on you, you just keep going faster and faster until you hit the ground at a really fast pace. Now on the moon, it's not quite so fast because the moon isn't as big as the Earth. The Earth is big. It has this 9.8 meters per second squared or 10 meters per second squared. The moon is only about one sixth of that. So here on Earth, I weigh about 225 pounds. That's how much gravity is pulling on me. On the moon, I'm only about one-sixth of that. I weigh a little under 40 pounds. Now I'm just as blobby and I still look like I'm in my second trimester, but I weigh a lot less. That's why those astronauts in those big clunky spacesuits that weigh several hundred pounds actually didn't have to worry about it because they only weighed a couple hundred pounds here on Earth. By the time they got up to the moon, they didn't weigh much at all and their own body weighed less as well. Now, we have different kinds of forces. We have gravitational forces. We have centripetal forces as things are going around in a circle, for example. We have an acceleration. This is acceleration because here's the thing. Speed is how fast you're going. Acceleration is how fast you're going as it changes along the way. And that change can be in direction or in speed. As you're going around a circle here, even if you're going around the circle at 50 miles an hour, you are accelerating the whole time because you're changing direction the whole time. So we are accelerating whenever we're going around in a circle. That's why if you're going down the highway towards Indianapolis and you're going on 69 and you're just going straight, say it's 60 miles an hour, maybe 70 miles an hour, and then you hit a curve, even if you're not going faster, things in the car feel different. 
because you're now accelerating, you're changing direction as you go around the curve. And here we can see as things go further and further out, this is that law from Kepler, that third law, as things go further and further out from the sun, they're going actually slower and slower and slower around the sun. We can think about this if we were to look at a, uh, an ice skating event at the Olympics. You may have seen ice skaters who pull their arms in and go around much faster, then put their arms out and go more slowly. That's because as the skater pulls her arms in, there's less of an area she has to spin so she can accelerate, go faster. As she puts her arms out, it swings around a wider area, and therefore, to conserve momentum, she slows down. So this larger area times the spin equals this shorter area times the more spins. Now, when we are talking about those people in the space station, again, it seems like they're all up there in weightlessness, but the reason they are in weightlessness is because they're actually in what we call free fall. As they are falling through space, they're actually falling towards the planet. But as they fall, they're falling at just the right speed that the planet's getting out of the way. So as they fall, the planet gets out of the way, and it falls again, and the planet gets out of the way. It's timed just precisely, so it doesn't break away from the planet, but it doesn't fall into the planet. So everyone in there is sort of like in an elevator, where the string has been cut and everything inside is falling, but it will never hit the ground because it's falling in the right loops. That's true for the planets and asteroids and comets and other things that go around the sun as well. They are all going around and they're all sort of falling into the sun, but they're in a constant motion and they are a constantly moving without any outside forces process taking place here. Now, everything tugs on everything else, so everything pulls a little bit here and there along the way, and that we'll talk about that, especially when we talk about Mercury and how it moves around the sun. But there are lots of asteroids, there are lots of comets, there are lots of planets that pull on each other. The smaller you are, the bigger the pull will, will register on you. The larger you are, the less it will do that. That's why we see these blue and these red uh, orbits here. The red is cometary orbits, and the blue are uh, the, the asteroid orbits. Notice they're all off-center by quite a bit, and that's because they're a lot smaller than everything else. As we shoot something into orbit, we can sort of think about what we're really doing is firing a rocket, firing a bullet or something into orbit. As we fire something, we have enough force, it reaches down, uh, say you, you throw a football down the football field, you put more force around it with, with a machinery and it can reach the next town. It, you put more machinery around it, it can reach the next continent. You put more machinery around it and you can reach orbit you can keep going and going and going as this happens. And this whole idea actually is not new. This isn't Einstein, this isn't quantum physics, this is, in fact, Newtonian mechanics. He figured out all of this as well. What we really need is the technology to be able to do this. That's why I kept using that word machinery. What we really need is force, but we use machinery to get that, uh, that force. We use something that is a rocket engine, and it's a very simple kind of machine. Uh, doesn't have to be lots of technology. Uh, machines can be very simple, uh, but it takes a lot to get into orbit. We have a lot of things in orbit. Here we can see lots of satellites in orbit, and this isn't even the half of them. And of course, Elon Musk wants to put up thousands of more objects in space. So space is actually pretty crowded. And we have supercomputers. I mean, think about the desktop computer you're working on today. And look, this is an entire room at the Ames Research Center in NASA has. All of these computers are tasked just to keep track of all of those objects that were in the previous picture, as well as hundreds of thousands of more objects. Anything the size of a fingernail or larger 
needs to be tracked because if it's going 16 or 17,000 miles an hour and hits the Hubble Space Telescope or hits the International Space Station or hits any of our other satellites that are up there, that becomes an issue because that's a real problem. So we have this major, major technology that is dealing with that. We hope someday to be able to go up and retrieve some of the space junk that's up there. But for now, we have to watch where we're launching and watch where we're going. So that's our chapter three. And I thank you for being part of this one. And let's see, I will stop sharing that there and I'll bring myself back. Yay, there I am. So on to chapter four, and I will provide you with another lecture. Thanks.